The two Jills, a psychologist and psychic intuitive, reveal mind-blowing insights that turn psychology, self-help, and conscious teachings on their heads. Why? Because they work. Real help, sincere growth is here. Welcome to Psyched. Hey, Jill. Hi, Jill. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm in Miami today. So I'm a moving target. Lovely. You never you never know where you're gonna, <laughs> you know, where you're gonna get me. But um it's I it's, love you know, the it's, background. Is it wood or you. is it stone? It's wood. It's wood. Okay. Um, Beautiful. But it's it's nice to tune in in all these different places and kind oh, of totally. bring psyched to to all my areas. I actually really love it. I love um, it too. All right. So today's topic. Yeah. Today we are going to talk about confidence self-esteem and insecurity and basically kind of tee up the idea that these may be trivial pursuits. And I think you and I will go into it and, you know, really see and maybe help people rethink this a little bit and how they comport themselves in when, you know, when they're thinking about confidence or not confidence and how they suggest that other people behave. Um, when they're going through a situation, right? It comes, this is something that just comes into play so much that I think it really deserves a discussion. Love it. I love this topic. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start off by saying that I favor confidence over lack of confidence. And I know some people are more confident <laughs> being unconfident. <laughs> because of fear of seeming arrogant or unlikable. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I really, I appreciate that part. But to me, arrogance and confidence are two totally different things. Arrogant is I'm better than you. And that, that energy kind of comes across and it does feel cringy and icky and is unlikable. But being confident to me is not saying anything about the value of you over another person. It's saying, I'm equipped well to do this, or I have a success record at this, or I know I've done okay and met my own standards or other people's standards at this before. That's different, right? So I, I really favor confidence in general with people. I find unconfident um, people to be extremely needy in multiple ways. And it, to me, it's energetically draining because there's so much energy placed on the others in their life to try to help them feel like they're good enough or they're capable enough. And I just, I think that's a really um, unhealthy energetically and physically unhealthy way to go through life. I totally agree. And I think that the reason this conversation is so good is because I don't believe anybody is not confident. Mm. That's actually what the issue is. And that's why I talk about it a little bit as a trivial pursuit, because we, that's a belief that we're not confident, that we're not okay, that we're not equipped. And it comes with adopting really standards, other people's standards. And we measure ourselves against those standards and we we develop this idea about ourselves that we're not good enough, we are good enough, we're always good enough. I mean, I don't even like the word enough. We're amazing, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, more than enough, right? We, we're overflowing with this stuff. But I think when we choose to take in the wrong data points, we can really go awry. So yes, if you're believing you are not confident, that can come out in needy ways. We want to say, let's get you back to the confidence that is inherent in you. And if you don't like the word confidence, go with comfort comfort in yourself at all times in all situations and then you won't get confused about am i confident am i not confident you can actually replace it because confidence is such a loaded word right mm -hmm. it is. Um, and it's so aspirational and it, it doesn't seem like like part of us it always seems like something mm -hmm. we have to energetically work at it it seems right. like a, a lot um, so anyway, I like the word comfort. I like that either word, either word and people that are triggered by words, give us a little slack, please. And just <laughs> let yourself listen. That's your brain saying, I don't like that word. Okay. Your brain doesn't have to like every word we choose. <laughs> right. 
but there still might be something incredible here for you. So give us a little attitude on the words we pick because there's so many different words we can use. Jill Langler's great with language. I'm pretty good with language too, right? Um, what I want to offer and is that I feel like everybody's confident in something. So even the most insecure people I know, they disregard their own strengths and abilities, right? And so that's something really valuable to look at. If you find yourself to be emotionally needy and insecure and unconfident, what is something in your life that somebody has complimented you on or that you do without even thinking? And if you really give yourself some some space to look at it, it's something that other people struggle with or they don't even attempt to do, right? I have a loved one that we were talking recently about um, Thanksgiving. She prepares an amazing Thanksgiving. She doesn't have any help. She does it all herself. And that is so, I'm intimidated by that idea of a one stop. I'm going to put all of this stuff together and it's going to taste great. It's going to get to the table on time. And what's cold is going to be cold. And what's supposed to be hot is going to be hot. I think she's a freaking miracle worker that she does all that. Um, And she's like, oh, it's easy, you know, see, but in so many other aspects of her life, Jill, she's incredibly insecure and very um, self-judgmental, right? I feel like she holds herself to a really impossible standard at things that don't even matter as much, right? So if there is something that you can find in your life that you do really, really well, naturally, it may not be as impressive as you want it to be. But what I want to point out is you do have the ability to be successful, to be confident and to know what that feels like. I feel I sense that to have something in your life that you feel savvy and well equipped for, and with a nice long positive track record that you know, then you can be like, Oh, my God, I could feel like that. in all of these other things that I stress and fret and delay and procrastinate over, yeah, yeah, you could, right? And it it may not mean all of a sudden being amazing at it, right? But it's giving yourself the space to be your best at it. Nobody's asking you to be these impossible standards that are sometimes, now I don't even want to say set by society. It doesn't matter if they're offered by society. It's that we can run those loops, those programs of, well, I can't wear a bikini because I don't look like, you know, Giselle. (laughs) I do think, you know, I do think that we can help people even, I I love what you're saying, because you're, you're saying in order to program in this level of confidence, we have to first identify it. So you're saying, make the identification, look somewhere where you're feeling this this kind of confidence i will tell you it's in a place probably where there's just ease it's there's so much ease there that you don't consider it a skill or confident you don't have standards in that in that space right so go to something that is probably easeful for you and then see to your point that maybe other people it's not as easeful for um but the other piece is that i like to say is I don't think we can compartmentalize so so well. So my point is the brain likes to break things up into pieces. It's It likes to fracture everything, including us. And so it says, I'm good over here. I'm confident over there, but I'm not confident over here. I don't believe that. I believe that confidence is one trait and it doesn't have to be specific to something that you do and that this doesn't contradict find the feeling of confidence through something that you do that's a feeling and hold on to that feeling and we're trying to recreate that feeling but for that feeling to come out you have to have confidence it has to be a part of you in order to come out in any form right so Mm -hmm. watch the brain trying to break it up into You have to learn a million different things to be confident in a million different places. And frankly, you don't have the confidence that you can do that. Hmm. So so the idea is let's not try to, you know, play the whack-a-mole. Let's back it up even further and say, I, the confidence is in me. It's one, it's whole, it's solid. 
It's with me at all times and it's not situation specific. Yeah. So this is good. And the word I want to, the word that's coming up for me here is it's about self-trust, right? That relative that we were using in that example, she trusts herself to get an, a, the most important meal in some people's families on the table for everybody, right? She trusts herself in that. And then so many other aspects of her life, she doesn't trust herself, right? So I love what you're saying here. There are so many reasons to trust ourselves. Even the fact that we're alive today, right? Think of all the things that could have gone wrong and that maybe you had control over, you know, you know, seeing that car before it swerved in, swerved in your lane or that doesn't feel like a good idea. I don't think I should go with my friends when I was 15 years old <laughs> or whatever. There are so many great decisions that allowed you to survive even in this world. It's a dangerous world, Right. It, so and there are so many reasons to be to be self-trusting. And that's a system that you either access or don't access. And you're right. We're talking about specific applications. I don't know if everyone knows the trivia pursuit little pies, but there's all these slices. It literally is a pie. Um, there's all these slices of, well, I trust myself here, but not here. So I love what you're saying is, no, the, the self-trust, the confidence, and the esteem, it isn't about the slice. It's about the container, the structure, the base of the pie. That's you. And you can bring that trust, offer it to everything you do in every situation that you experience yourself in. And I feel like you are going to be a better you and everybody's going to benefit from that. Perfect. It's to me, it's a one and done. Right. And the way I look at it is this to to give an example of how we fragment, how the brain fragments. Look at civil rights. Civil Mm. rights to me is one and done. It should be. We have civil rights or we don't. It's not who has them and who we have to fight to get them for now. We're either human and we have civil rights and everybody has civil rights or we don't. But people now are trying to become a part of an even smaller, smaller fractal and mm. then fight for the for the same thing like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense if you really mm. think about it to keep dividing what to me is so obvious as civil rights mm. right so this is what the brain does and it's doing it to us too on a on an individual level and the loop, you know, you and I talk about brain loops all the time. We can't trust ourselves because we don't have confidence to trust ourselves. And we can't get the confidence to trust, you know, it's sort of like this, this self feeding loop is that you think you need confidence to trust yourself. You don't, you don't. That's an overlay. It's something that's not required. Just wake up today and trust yourself. You don't need a reason. You don't need, you, you can look at reasons again, like you say, look for the reasons because that sets you energetically going in the right direction. But once you start to do it, you should be asking yourself, why don't I trust myself? Where did that crazy idea come from? Where did the idea come from that I I'm not comfortable in myself mm-hmm. wherever I go. That that's I want to jump in. I oh, want to jump yeah. in here, but I don't want to interrupt you. Um, but I just did. Sorry. <laughs> um, that that whole what you were just touching on right there. Why don't I trust myself? And I'm I'm a little cautious, and I'm I'm sensing that you are too about about how much time somebody spends in that why space. But my instinct tells me that most people that don't trust themselves, something didn't go the way they wanted it to. And the minute something didn't go the way they wanted it to, and the bigger it was, the more that, you know, lack of trust, that lack of confidence was put in. But just because something didn't go the way you wanted it to, doesn't mean it was your fault. Doesn't mean you were responsible. Doesn't mean you were the reason that it didn't work out. So think of like love relationships, romantic relationships, there's so many, so many people that are incredibly, the people that I know that are the, if you will, the um, least successful at um, 
feeling happy and healthy in a loving romantic relationship, they are so successful in so many other ways in their life. And they have, they trust themselves in so many ways, but they don't trust themselves with the romance department. But think of what, I mean, a romantic relationship, the more it may be idealized by an individual of this should be easy. That is one of the most complicated relationships we have, right? With work relationships, you get so many breaks from these people, right? With family relationships where you're all living together or a romantic relationship where you're sharing a lot of space together, there's you just increase your chances of being dissatisfied with another person, right? So time together even, it's like, okay, how much grace and compassion are we going to allow? That's a deal breaker. That's a deal breaker. That's a deal breaker. All these things. So the reasons that we something may not have gone well may not have anything to do with you, right? It may be something that maybe you guys just didn't get together, just didn't work well together. You didn't but you didn't add, uh, there wasn't bringing out the best in each other, which to me is the is the magic of any successful romantic um, partnership is that the, the two individuals feel their best when they're with that other person. That other person makes it easiest for them to be their best self, right? And it brings out the best in them. So those to me are the, the most satisfying relationships. But anyway, so this whole idea that, you know, the why, you're probably personalizing it. You're probably making something your fault that was never your fault. And then you lost your trust in yourself, which was never necessary. And it's important to access that again, allow it again. I think that's really important for people to, you know, to kind of take in. I think one of the reasons why we don't sort of, while while we attribute when things go wrong, we attribute them to us, you know, but the weird thing about the brain, and this is, this is for 99% of people, we care more about what other people think than what we think. And not only that, it gets worse. We care more a lot of times about what strangers think of us than loved ones think of us. When somebody, you know, a total stranger does something on, you know, to your Snapchat, I don't really know how any of this stuff works, but, you know, when somebody comments or, you know, negatively on a tweet or who knows, these people are strangers, right? They're complete strangers and it knocks you into a tailspin. It's so interesting. So you have to really watch your brain because that Mm -hmm. is demoralizing, number one. It undermines confidence, the confidence that we we have. It works against our innate confidence because we're giving our confidence away, basically, our power away to random input. Yep. We do it all day long. There's, and I'm not trying to be defensive um, about individuals that get overly sensitive about strangers commenting, um, but I do understand that. I'm I'm super sensitive. I feel like that's actually one of the reasons I am so good at what I do is that I am, I mean, even like a hypersensitive, but somehow I'm high functioning, so I've made this work. Um, it's public. And any of us in leadership, management, um, public situations have, I mean, I, I think it's well known that if you're going to be critical of someone, you do it in private. If there's a student that you're working with or an employee that you're working with, you, uh, I need, let's talk for a sec, right? You pull them outside into a private space for so many reasons, by the way, they're going to hear you better because you're not publicly shaming them, Right. And it could just be an evolutionary um, flaw that we have all of this technology making it, you have no relationship with these people, but there's this, this basic anthropological sensitivity that most humans have about public shaming and public criticism, right? So we haven't uh, created, evolved yet the skill set for doing that in a nurturing kind of manner, right? So in this situation, it's, I'm not, I know, I'm not, let's see, 
<laughs> it's going to be a little glitchy here for a second. And because I am so public with what I do, and I, I definitely get weird, just obtuse criticism from total strangers about, and it's rare. It's rare. It's like 0.01% that I get any criticism. Thank God. But I know I don't, I have no relationship with these people. So I can't trust them. Right. But I trust myself. Right. I have to be there for me so that if someone does decide to take advantage of an opportunity, if there's a, a comment option or a thumbs down button or they create an opportunity of, you know, whatever. Um, there are some individuals that that's their thrill. And it's so subversive and just so cringy and probably not something they would do in person um, with anybody. But it's important to trust yourself enough that even when there is public criticism, that you reassess, okay, who is this person? Do I know this person? How much do I want their criticism to mean to me? How much do I want it to mean, even if it was done publicly, even if I would never do that to another person, even if clearly they have a different value and moral, moral set than I do, right? I think, yeah. yes. So that that is a good point about the public aspect of it. I think what, you know, what, me, you know, social media has done has made these, has made a space for people to just be unkind and rude. When I'm saying that we listen a lot more to what strangers think, let's take it out of the social media domain for a second and just look at it as a brain function that <clears throat> basically social media put on crack. But mm -hmm. but there is there is a habit of us trusting other people more than we trust ourselves. And there mm -hmm. is a habit for listening to people who don't know us more than listening to people who do know us. We tend to think those things are more objective and we have a thought that people don't, people who know us in some ways don't get us, right? Like they're just like, you don't get me. There's so, there's so much of that in families, you know, you don't understand me. I would argue that they probably, and I'm only going to argue this in a good way, not the negative way. Yeah, good. When somebody is saying like nice things to you and you're dismissive and you're like, you don't really know the whole story kind of situation. <laughs> I think they're seeing a part of you that you don't spend enough time seeing, right? There is always that light part and we're focused on the dark parts. And when we focus on the dark parts, of course, we're not going to have confidence, right? You know, our confidence is not going to be visible to us because we're only going to see our flaws. So if you're only looking at your flaws, you are inherently not understanding who you are. Mm -hmm. And as, as a failure to understand who you truly are, you could think that you need to chase confidence, just like you need to chase happiness, another trivial pursuit, right? It's not out there for you. It's not a set of circumstances. So I agree with you. Public shaming, that's like the deep end of the pool. That's that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, watch how often you do this mm -hmm. and how undermining it is to you. You don't take in what loved ones say, you take in what strangers say, and you trust them over you. That is the spiral that takes you further and further away from yourself, basically. I love it. And that that spiral that you're talking about to me, it is entirely thought-based. And the beautiful thing is, in so many ways, we have full authority over our thoughts, or at least it would be advantageous to feel like you do, right? So I'm not, I'm not asking anyone to try to get rid of the thoughts of I'm not this, I'm not good enough, or I'm not this enough, or I'm not, I'm, I fall short here, I'm terrible there, whatever. I don't feel like those thoughts with people that I've worked with ever really go away. There's a whole traction system that they have in their brain to go to the darkest, there are the darker layers of themselves or even others. But what I'm what I have found really successful is creating, creating, not looking for, not going on a journey outside of yourself, creating through trial and error 
a system of positive thoughts that you add next to the negative thoughts. And if it will take a lot of effort. And I do think a trap a lot of people fall into is, yeah, but I still have, I still have the self-loathing kind of thoughts. You probably always will. You will probably always have the part of you that I'm not good enough here. Maybe it's not self-loathing. Maybe it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm not good enough to do that. I'm not good enough to have confidence in this area. Or, or are you? right? Or are you right. right? So I get really excited about confidence and self esteem, because I think it goes to the function of enjoying yourself, and therefore enjoying your life. Yeah, that's I why to ask. me, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's so worth it to create that system. Because without a system of not only I mean, for base, the uh, uh, baseline grade is, hey, not so bad. I didn't do so bad, or I don't look so bad, or whatever, wherever the the source of the insecurity is uh, good enough is starting point. Hey, that was actually really good, right? That was actually really good to have that thought about yourself and something that you used to only find where you were falling short is that it, that's those are the starting ingredients for liking yourself more. I know everybody's into self-love. I think self-like is a way more meaningful thing liking yourself, creating a version of you that you like. Yeah. And that goes, that goes to the comfort, you know, and definitely claiming your gains. We don't, we definitely don't do that enough. Um, you know, we're, we're much more flaw focused and, you know, you and I have spoke about this before, but I do it differently. So you, your, um, and this is just for people who do think, you know, yeah. there's, there's a million ways to do this, right? I also agree with you that the thoughts are that the thoughts are always going to be there and they can, right? I don't have any problem with weird shit popping into my head all day long. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, look where that's going, you know? Like, <laughs> why am I putting my brain in that direction? Okay, here we go. But for me, the strategy that I use is I I I kind of like take the sting out of the thought, right? I I basically I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not able personally to put a positive thought there because it's, mm. they don't, they're not canceling each other out for me. Um, so what I do first is I, I just, I almost like D I, I don't give the thought meaning. Mm. Right. So I'm like, okay, Jill, you're really stupid because you did whatever. I'm like, okay, great. You know, so what? I heard you. It's kind of, it's kind I of what, I, what I feel I, the words are for your method yeah. is so what? So yeah. what? I, I heard you. And a lot of times I do say when I know I'm going down in a, a dark place, I I don't try to push it away. I'm like, just bring it, bring it, bring it. And I listen to the whole diatribe, right? And then I'm like, I've heard you, you've spoken, and now we're done. Right. So I, I can give voice to it without emotionally connecting to it. Right. And that that to me opens the space for more positive thoughts, which are honestly always there. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so. Without all that mental real estate being taken up by not only am I thinking these thoughts and I'm going into the content of what these thoughts mean, I'm actually then be like, who thinks these thoughts, right? So I have the double whammy of shitty thoughts and going down a rabbit hole about how I'm going to die. And then I'm like, who, th who thinks these thoughts? Like only, only a really disturbed person would even mm -hmm. think this way to begin with, right? So you're in the content, you're undermining yourself. I don't follow content. I always say, I care what my brain is doing, not, you know, I care that it's saying those things, but I don't care what it's saying. To me, again, that's all content and I don't pay attention to content. Um, to me, it's like negative content all falls in the same bucket, right? It's one thing, negative thoughts. It's just one bucket. I don't care what the thought is. And yet I like that you said earlier that you are willing to listen to it, right? That you're not yes. trying to deny it. You're not saying, no, I'm not going to listen to you. There is this sort of like, yes, and you're just not giving it more power than it deserves. Because and like that, you're saying, that's huge. And that gives me confidence. 
I like that. Right. Because I don't have to be like, how am I going to handle this? What am I going to do? You know, I don't feel helpless to my thoughts. I can bring it, hear it. And then when I don't go down that rabbit hole, oh my God, Mm -hmm. I'm elated because I know how, I know what used to happen, Mm -hmm. right? When that shit show would start. Right. So that is me really, and I hadn't thought about it before, but it, it does connect me to my, to my confidence. And it's not by getting rid of those thoughts. It's Mm-mm. definitely not, but it is totally very agree. much disconnecting, you know, from, from sort of the, the scourge of them or the, yes. the react reaction. Yeah. Let me just take a moment with this next part here. The weight of it and the meaning of it feels like there's a lot of, there's a lot of empowerment there, right? So for individuals that I find or that are coming to me with trying to be more confident, trying to, you know, feel more capable in a certain area, they've oftentimes not been objective and reasonable with themselves about what standard is sufficient right? And what I find with some people is that they're, they're very idealistic, perhaps, or they're very type A, very perfectionistic. And what I like to help them notice is, you're never going to have an, an okay, I'm there now, part of you. I don't think you're ever going to feel that way. So what do you want to do about that? Right? Do you want to create a version of you that can say, it's good enough? It's good enough. Could I do better? Always. Could I do worse? Always. <laughs> right. So that is, that's, a, again, that's a system of you that you create to, is it counterbalancing? Is it a writing? I just look at that as another menu item. I don't want to have my only thoughts be negative and, you know, creating insecurity, which I don't think creates a better version of us. So I had to add a system of Maybe it's, maybe it's great here. Maybe it's good enough here so that I have other menu items of thoughts to believe, to operate and to take action from, right? So when I think of, you know, some, I don't want to say it's just women because I know it isn't just women, but um, a lot of insecurities were sort of seeded in um, our emotional, hormonal teenage years, Right. So there were, I, I find that most people that have insecurities, they were kind of the patterns of, you know, deflection, overreaction, um, passive aggressive responses were kind of, they were kind of formed and formulated um, as a matter, measure of self-protection, probably in those teenage years. What a terrible time to create patterns, right? Frontal cortex, right? Center of reason and judgment. Um, And I think probably emotional intelligence hasn't even developed yet. That's a part of the brain that we don't have until most people are 20 to even 24 years old, right? So those patterns are, they are begging to be questioned, right? Those patterns are begging to be dismantled and reassembled with a more mature, whole and complete version of us. And I think some adults never did that. They never questioned those patterns. So I mean, therapy can do that, but not all therapy does that, sadly, right? I don't blame therapists or therapy. I just, I think some systems are kind of, they just keep handing out band-aids versus I know what I do. And Jill, I know from my conversations with you, there's a whole kind of like, wait, let me, did you notice this? I mean, this whole puzzle is messed up. I mean, this isn't, this is never going to work, right? So you talking about your feelings from this broken system is never going to actually create a better system for you to operate within. It's because you're, you're really pulling from the system is broken and you're looking for answers in the system, a right? That's, that's never going to work. In this case, you know, the brain is misleading us and yet we're still asking it for answers, right? So it's like, you have to, we talk about this all the time. You have to go beyond your brain. It's a closed mm-hmm. thought system. Yes. It is a closed thought system. So the idea is you're trying to what it's like a snow globe. What lies outside the snow globe, mm-hmm. right? That's what you and I are always 
like noodling and, 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 you know, we're, we're just not stuck in the globe, you know, that let's put it that way. So as an example, I had this criteria for myself, what makes a good person? I don't know. You know, I mean, there's a whole list of criteria about how you, how and why, how you feel about yourself and why, because you're always in this constant, even though you don't realize it, measuring yourself up against your criteria. And one day I really kind of decided like, I'm choosing those criteria Mm -hmm. and I'm choosing to berate myself against the criteria that I've chosen. And all of a sudden, like the house of cards just comes down Mm -hmm. because why would I do either of those things? Mm -hmm. Why would I hold criteria? Why would I judge myself? And when you take out that kind of like ball of, I don't know, shit, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like, you don't even know what to do with your brain. It's so quiet. My brain used to be, oh my God, so loud, so obsessive, so nonstop. Like, I I don't know how I lived like that. Mm. And now there's quiet. And I always say, so that's the mental real estate that we're trying to kind of buy back. The brain doesn't always have to be on. It's not, it's just always churning. And we just don't, we don't have to do that. But certainly it's churning because these beliefs are are creating actions. Misery. (laughs) Misery. And misery. (laughs) Misery. But you don't realize how much you can throw out and still be, perfectly fine. You don't need a yes. standard for yourself. You don't. No, you don't. Oh my gosh. So you were saying at the beginning, something about like beliefs. I think you use the word beliefs. And what I want to point out here, the reason this is so important now that you're talking about standards, they're, they're so subjective. Use that to your advantage, right? Use it to your advantage, right? Have a freaking dry erase board of, of it's like, well, I'm not measuring up here. Okay, take whatever you're measuring yourself up against, right? A person, a thing, an idea, some sort of criteria that again, you're operating for yourself, right? And just erase it all the time and redo it and give your, so some people say, well, that that means being um, less than my best. And, right? If that's that a judgment. system, it is a judgment. And I'm okay with that. I get it. I actually understand it. But here's the thing, at what expense? At what expense is operating in that modality getting you? Or is it helping you your, be your, your most likable, lovable you, where you like yourself and maybe even the people that matter to you like you? Or is it making it harder for you to be a likable, lovable, lovable version of you, where you like yourself? Right. The other strategy I think works great is when some something is happening, maybe if it's triggering insecurity, um, there's somebody else maybe there with you. And if somebody, if you can tell you're rattled by it or just like completely, you know, ah, major triggered by it, who else is near you that just experienced basically the same thing and they're calm? right? Whether it's a flight getting delayed or, you know, whatever. And you're just like, oh my God, can you believe it? Can you believe this happening? Look for the calm people. Those are your people. Okay. Not the other ones freaking out because that, that system of, oh my God, I I have to find other people that are upset by this, want to get angry by this. That just is breeding further insecurity, lack of self-trust, lack of high functioning, really. So I, I've had so many times where, where my husband, God bless him, um, something really bothered me. And I'm like, did it bother you? And I love, I'm so glad I asked him because he's like, no, I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but there's nothing I can do about it, Jill. And it's like the angels sing <laughs> when he says that, because he just showed me the exit door from my frustration, right? But there's nothing I can do about it, Jill. 
And I am not the first one to see that sometimes, right? So there's this whole kind of like, ah, you know, feeling unsettled and not comfortable, very uncomfortable, right? So that's a, that's a huge one. Look for the people that are calm in a situation, right? Teenage years and acting like a teenager as an adult. Oh my God, you know, uh, I wasn't dressed appropriately or whatever. Somebody else probably isn't dressed according to the, you know, the invitation either. Are they having a good time? Are they letting themselves have a good time, even though they're overdressed or way too casual for some sort of function? Because we have so many choices in all of those, all of those situations. I think, you know, I like the story that you that you bring up with your husband. My husband does that for me, too. We are we're never both, you know, imploding at the same time. Right. So it's like we seek the calm in each other um, when when one of us is melting and it's super, super helpful. You know, but one of the things that I wrote down is another another reason why we avoid the calm is because the brain says nothing I can do is unacceptable. Nothing, there's nothing I can do to the brain is helpless. It's the opposite of the obvious in this case. You want to get to the point where there's nothing you can do. Let's let's not go into the deep end of the pool. Let's not go into the worst case scenarios. Let's not talk about your latest illness. Let's let's focus on things like delayed planes and things that normally get your back up, you know, or, you know, just just everyday nonsense, little minor road rage, whatever, whatever you want it to be. But basically, the brain is is saying and it, it's almost trying to make you powerful by being aggressive. The brain equates power with aggression. Obviously, the state of the world reflects that power and aggression Aggression always comes from fear, always, in my opinion, but it always comes from fear. Aggression is not strength. It's not confidence. It's actually belies the lack of confidence and it actually makes you helpless. But Mm -hmm. when you, when your brain, when you can tell your brain, there's nothing I can do, you're schooling your brain, right? You're shutting it down. That's what you want to do. So oddly, embracing there's nothing I can do, which feels so icky, the brain does not like it. To me, it is the most empowering space. That's where I get my power. Because when there's nothing I can do, that's when I come online. The brain, by saying there's nothing I can do, I'm shutting off my brain. That's actually a light switch. Because the brain has nothing to noodle, I shut it down. The brain's saying, no, you can do something. You should do this and you should do this and you should get, you know, band together and, you know, take up arms. So by saying there's nothing I can do, you're turning that off. That's how you get outside the snow globe. So don't be duped by the brain telling you you're helpless if you don't aggress or if you don't act out or if you don't do something. Right? That's... That's wrong. You shut your brain off by saying there's nothing I can do. And you say it with a smile and you Mm -hmm. say it with satisfaction and you say it with confidence because that's when I've said it, but that's, that's when you come online. It's not a desperate situation. No, this notion of there's nothing I can do that when I, when I sort of accept that, when there's a part of my Jill, that's like, there's nothing I can do about that. I actually start to go into a more productive mode. There's nothing I can do about that. So what do I want to be? Or what, what can I make better in this situation? Right? I played, yeah, there's planes being delayed when we were on our way to a family vacation, the kids were probably two and five or something at the time. I came up with the silliest games that I, not a game game, like, like charades or whatever. We were just having we made it so fun to the point that when they finally, when they were finally boarding, one of my kids went, oh, does this mean the game's over? And I was just like, oh, we did great. We did great. Because I, I enjoyed it too, right? We enjoyed what is often a miserable, helpless experience. And we always have that choice. So stuck in traffic, whatever. And I know that we're kind of getting into different areas, but in a way, 
enjoyment of yourself and enjoyment of your life is so much about authority. The opposite of authority is insecurity and lack of confidence. So I feel like they are very much related. I agree. I agree. And it's it's such a good example. You you said it right. When I said you're going outside the snow globe and you come mm-hmm. online, you what steps into that space is a miracle. It can be amazing. Right? Sometimes like sometimes you know, the plane actually is like, "Oh, we're going to take off." Like you can't even imagine mm-hmm. what starts to happen once you shut the brain down. And you come back online. I remember I was going to visit you, right? And I missed, I'm on the plane and the, the, you know, the flight attendant said I need, I needed a connection in Salt Lake. And I, the flight attendant said, please let the people who have connecting flights off first. And I had time to make that flight if, the, if they, if people actually did that. But I could tell by the way things were going, there was so, people were so crazy. I could just tell I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And I was in the airport. I meet this person who was so down on his, on himself, funny enough. Mm. He was like a biologist, but he was mowing lawns. He just was like, you know, he wasn't living up to himself. He was just whatever. We had this conversation. I've never heard from him again, but you, but I was supposed to be, not supposed to be, I hate that. I was in that airport speaking to this guy, having a beautiful conversation, got the next flight. It was to me, it was magical that that we met, right? And I could, that I could offer him just a little bit of a different look on whatever, you know, on whatever he was um, stressing about. And he felt it. And he, you know, he he shared that. He definitely was like, this is, this is something else, you know, just, um, so I do think the getting out of the snow globe, that that's when I say the, that's where the power is. That's mm-hmm. where the creation starts. That's where the productivity, if that, that's the word you use, but that's where the productivity, that's where you start. Yeah. Just, I don't know. It's, it's you meeting you. Right. It's sort of like whatever was separated comes together. And it's yeah. it's amazing. It is amazing. I totally agree. And I love that story. Um the other part I want to add here are the individuals that we may interact with that seem to you with them seems to be a recipe for you feeling bad about yourself, um, insecurity, that sort of thing. Now, when somebody feels insecure or less than regularly with another, with another person, it can be that the other person is acting in a malicious, um, either aware of it or not aware of it, just sort of, they're just bringing out the worst in everybody. It can be that, but it can also be but there's something that that person is or that they embody is that just there's, it just like exacerbates any insecurities that somebody has, but they're not doing anything malicious. They're just being themselves, right? Which, whichever the case, I think it's really important to notice that, that for whatever reason, that person doesn't bring out the best in you. And it's no one's job, by the way, to bring out the best in you. But when someone does, it's magical. And hopefully you do that for other people too. That's a really, really win-win kind of dynamic that can happen. But this idea that there are there are some people that just, they're toxic. Um, they just, you know, like, kind of surprised you chose those shoes today. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing nice about that, especially when you're already out. That would have been, if you were at home with them while you were getting dressed, that would be nice. But there's there's no good that can come from that when you're already out. You don't have your closet with you. Hello, right? I actually tend to avoid those people, right? I don't have people like that in my life right now. And it that is part of my enjoyment of my me and enjoyment of myself. Because it takes so much now, a, a better version of Jill <laughs> wouldn't have been bothered with it to begin with. If somebody said, I'm kind of that interesting shoe choice, you know what I mean? Clearly disapprovingly, Right. Um, they're a better version of Joe would have been like, they're so comfy. I love them and skated on, not even bothered. Right. 
But if there is a version of me that can be like, you know what? I just want, I'm just here to have fun. I don't care what shoes I'm wearing and I don't care what your shoes you're wearing. But people that are like that, that are a little a bit malicious about it, whether they're, again, whether they're aware of it or not, it, you can feel the maliciousness of it, but they're not trying to bring, bring out the best in you. I avoid those people. I really do. Wherever I have an option in social circles, you know, any sort of thing, they're just, they're not my people. I don't understand what's fragmented in there. I'm happy to help them as a client, but in my free time as my Jill, I'm not going to gravitate or make time for individuals like that. They're just trying to stir up shit. So there are so many layers, right? To what you're talking about. There's so, Mm -hmm. there's, there are like a hundred different ways that this plays out, (laughs) right? You know? Yeah. And I think, I think the important part here is meet your, meet yourself where you are, Mm. right? Do take stock of who makes you feel good and who doesn't make you feel good and, and honor where you are in that moment, right? Because a lot of times we're like, I should be over this. I should be okay with this. I should, and this shouldn't be bothering me, right? Like other people, it doesn't bother. It bothers you, right? This is where we go back to the trust piece, Mm -hmm. right? This is where we undermine our own authority. We trample our own integrity. You can't keep doing that and get away with it, right? You can't keep trampling yourself, hoping one day this isn't going to bother you. It's It's not self-loving. It's so not self-loving. And you're not going to get to to self-love through staying in it, right? So that's why I'm saying take stock now, wherever you are now, Mm -hmm. and decide this person doesn't bring out the best in me. I don't feel good when I'm around that person. I don't care if it's them or you. It really doesn't matter to me, right? It kind of, you don't, you just don't keep putting salt in a wound, you know, you you just, you gotta, you gotta change it up. And so don't let your lack of, it doesn't take confidence to, to leave that person right? It just takes awareness. And authority. Authority. Well, authority over meaning your, you have your, a choice. Over yourself. Yeah, that you do have a choice. And for some people that are like, well, then I won't have any friends. If I don't, sometimes it's the queen bee, the queen bee, or the, the king bee <laughs> kind of role that tends to be this kind of toxic manipulator. And there's so many people that are afraid to make them mad. And yet they make everybody feel insecure and less than almost intentionally. It's so bizarre, right? Those are people you may not even miss. Maybe it's not worth it. Those types of relationships and what, what you think you're gaining from it, is it worth it? Now you can create a whole other friend group, right? There's so many other people that you have choices to hang out with. And sometimes those people that are more toxic, that do almost create and fester on other people's insecurities, They're completely avoidable if you give yourself the permission that there are other people in the world, other things you could be doing, other parties you can be invited to or invite people to, right? Well, the other piece of that for for me personally, the way this went was there's a fear of being alone. Mm -hmm. And that also didn't make sense to me, right? That's where the comfort came in you you can't leave i guess the idea is you the brain is telling you you don't want to leave this group you'd rather suffer than be alone that's not true Mm -mm. and being alone is not suffering that's also not true if especially if you like yourself by the way well, that's, that's where you have to get to, right? So the only way to start liking yourself, it's almost like you have to cut out the things like if you're, if you're trying to diet, right? You, you have to cut out the foods that aren't going to work for you so that you could start losing weight and get to a healthier place. If that's, if that's what you, as an example, right? You can't keep eating the foods and be in a healthier place. They don't work at the same, at the same time. Might they Mm -hmm. one day? Yes. Are they working cohesively now? They're not. 
right? So you have to decide, you know, from a health perspective, what are the toxins as you describe? And you have to get rid of the toxins. You can't heal with healthy. the toxins yeah. still there, right? And so once you get stronger, being away from, you know, for me, it's like that kryptonite, right? Once you get mm -hmm. stronger from, from the assault of that and you, you break away from that and you don't have that, then, you know, again, it's working with your brain about what alone means, what lonely means. Those are two different things. Um, can you still like yourself, trust yourself, be comfortable with yourself and be alone? The answer is yes, yes, and yes, mm -hmm. right? The brain doesn't leave space for that, right? Because the brain is a reactor. And if it's just you, it doesn't have a lot of fodder to fuck you up with, right? <laughs> so so there is there is a space that people are deeply, deeply afraid of that I would say, don't be afraid of that space. And don't be afraid of that space for other people. I can remember like telling people, you know, just suck it up. It's your roommate. You're, you know, just suck it up. It, no, I, I don't say those things anymore. You know, I don't think you should suck it up. I, I really don't. Um, it doesn't make you a better person to suck shit up. It really doesn't. The other, th this goes to what you were just saying. There might be a, there might be another time, another season of you that may be fine with that roommate. But if it isn't today, if it isn't now, then that's what deserves your attention, right? Because again, exposing yourself to that type of toxicity isn't going to, I don't think it does make people a better person. I think it's, it's so toxic that it actually fosters a worse version of you overreactive, hypersensitive, et cetera. The other thing- A lot of anxiety. To, a lot of anxiety and mm -hmm. impossibility to please, right? Um, yeah. For some individuals that, that they have almost like a lifelong experience of insecurity and lack of confidence, I mean, I do encourage them to seek out some sort of professional. I love helping people with this, Jill. I, I, you are masterful as well at helping people see like, where is the false structure that you're feeling like you need to uphold here, right? I'm I'm really good at that. I know you're really good at that. Some people aren't really good at that. And it takes an outside totally objective force um, that that is saying everything with love and positive intentions for you, right? To really amazing things can happen, right? And sometimes it is an 80-20 rule, right? Sometimes it is, um, when I've had a client sometimes say something, I'm like, and I'm just picking up again with my gift of this, that doesn't even sound like you. Is that who's, when you hear the voice in your head of, of that logic, that, that, you know, no, you're not ready. Who does it have like a person that you feel associated with it? And sometimes it is, oh my God, that's my ex. Oh my God, that's my best friend. Oh my God, that is my mom. And I was never able to please her, Right. And you can just feel almost the excitement in them of, oh my God, I never realized that wasn't even me. Yep. That's what this the brain somebody, does. Exactly. This is somebody I cared a lot about. I did want to please them. I did like myself. I liked myself better when they were happy with me. And I've carried this screwed up, distorted, totally messed up system around this long. And the minute you point it out, it's almost like, you know, you're right. The emperor does have no clothes, right? There's mm -hmm. just this, because there's so much energy that we as humans can create for supporting a false structure. And I when you that. take it away, you get your energy back. It's like, oh my God, oh, now what do I want to do? I feel lightened. I feel buoyant. I feel free yeah. and breezy. And I can rethink this whole thing. Uh-huh. Exactly. It's so good. It's so good. A Course in Miracles just says we're overwhelmed only by our thoughts. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. You know, so, and yeah. I, I do want to go back to this idea that if there are people that you are feeling in your, in, that you have really close relationships within your life and you sense or they act as if they are impossible to please, do you have other options in that situation? Right. And on the other side, are you impossible to please sometimes with people in your life, right? There are definitely people that I know that are parents and they are rare to give out compliments to their kids. 
because you know there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of psycho psychological expectations that people have of no if I tell them they're going to doing a good job then they'll stop growing then they'll stop being their best then they'll stop striving there's cultures that are based on that literally that mentality that thought based system and if it works for somebody that's awesome but some people it doesn't work well for right and they never get that sense of you did such a great job there i'm so impressed i'll tell a story um, my youngest is doing online high school. It took a long time to say yes to that, but I did. Um, and she had a 4.0 last quarter. Jill, she did 98% of one of the classes in the two days before grades were due. I mean, there was a part of me going, this is so messed up. I mean, talk about procrastinator, wait until the last minute. But the outcome, I could not deny. <laughs> It was very impressive, right? I'm like 4.0. And you did like almost the entire semester in two days. Um, and I was like, that's impressive. <laughs> you know? Yes. Am I possibly encouraging like not healthy behavior? Possibly. But there is still the part of me going, God, that's impressive. There were probably I love people that. I, I read all the assignments, the whole calendar that, you know, barely squeaked a B or a C. It is impressive <laughs> to me. <laughs> Look, school is too long. I always said, you know, my son's goal in school was to do shit that he didn't like as fast as possible with the least amount of effort. That's basically what school is to me. So I don't really, you know, (laughs) but I will say what we're talking about is, you know, you had said if you're really like in your soup, you know, get get somebody to bounce this off of, right? And, And kind of look for your beliefs that keep you in this, in this relationship, right? Just look for them. You'll find them. And often they do have other people's voices connected to them that we've just internalized, right? That's what we do. When they stop saying it out loud, we we keep the show running. I mean, it's so crazy. Um, but one of the things that really started my journey here, and I think that this is what you and I are, you know, this this podcast is so good at, is that we're sort of offering permission right? You don't need our permission, obviously. But when somebody gave me permission to think differently, permission Mm. to look at it differently, permission to decide differently, or to look at myself differently, that really was like, it, it created a domino effect for me, right? Because we don't give ourselves that permission. The brain is pretty fixed. And it doesn't give us permission. Right. So that's really, you know, that's really what the issue is. Um, it's pretty beautiful, Joe. Yeah. It's so you don't, somebody is literally knocking on my door. I hear them. Go ahead. I don't even know what to do about that. (laughs) Get the door. I'll keep talking for us. So people that are impossible to please, one thing to keep in mind is they're, they're impossible to please. So if there's a people pleaser part of you that is trying to meet their standards, you could just lay down all of that ambition and just let it go. You could literally just let it go. Yeah. Anyway, so that's freedom you give yourself to Jill. I was just mentioning that people that are impossible to please that tend to kind of foster and and fester some of this insecurity and those in anyone that has it, they are literally impossible to please. So the attempt to try to please them is to me just for not, it's illogical. It's, it's unreasonable. It's, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And until you see it, it's like, oh my God. Right. So some people that hold themselves to really high standards and are constantly hard on themselves weirdly, they may actually gravitate towards somebody that has impossible standards, because they're comfortable with the sense of yes, I'm a better me when I am trying to please somebody that's impossible to please. So, oh, my God, the minute, I mean, it's just so sad. It's so sad. So anyway, just pointing that out, like, well, maybe if you stop trying to please that person, I am experimental, right? When I am feeling healthy enough, and I feel like the client's feeling healthy enough to are you willing to experiment, right? Do you need like, do you need like a break from this person? Like is this separation? Or are you healthy enough to play a little game with me? (laughs) Right? To just kind of go, okay, what if, what if the next time that person did have a jabby kind of comment, you were like, sorry to disappoint you. 
and you just had a huge smile on your face. You you can create other dynamics with people and that that can give you a lot of your energy back. It can help, help you like you. It can help you restore your confidence if you've lost it along the way. But the energy you know, feeling... has to be the energy has to be clean there though, right? So yeah. for instance, yeah. you can't say it in a passive aggressive way. You can't say it in a no. hurt, hurt way, you know. So it does to to your point, when you're feeling healthy enough, you can you can do that. Right. Otherwise, just run in the other direction. Because you know? it's yourself <laughs> space. You deserve yeah. like a lot of and, space between you and that person. Yeah. And the illogical, you know, we hold so many illogical beliefs. Oh, we so will many. say things like that person is impossible to please and still try. You know, and <laughs> yeah. I I I'm amazed at at it. And so we hold many of our beliefs are illogical, like, you know, uh, war brings peace, th- these types of things that just yeah. don't make any sense, you know, um, mm-hmm. gun, more guns bring safety, you know, so like, it's, they they don't create safety. Um, but I just, we these are the things that we kind of think and we kind of put together. Um, and if you spent a little time, you'd also notice that you have conflicting beliefs. You have, you hold beliefs that are diametrically opposed to each other. Yeah. All right. And that's why you need to pay more attention to your brain because it does try to compartmentalize so that you don't even know what you believe. Yeah. All right. And I, I would refer people to the beyond beliefs episode if you missed it or you, oh my God, that is a treasure chest of aha moments in that one. The other thing, Joe, when you were talking about, um, when you were, um, I think, agreeing with the idea of getting outsiders, you know, hopefully professionals, right? And I love professional, Joel's a professional. There's lots of professionals that help people see things from another another angle. I always go like this, because it does feel like that. You're twisting the globe and going, oh my God. Anyway, okay, so the first step is to reach out to someone. The second is to listen. Listen. Because a system of insecurity has a lot of uh, distortions and can't hear things, right? It's so important to listen. If you're actually going to the effort of reaching out to someone, it's so important to let let yourself trust yourself that you don't have to agree with everything they say. You know, you can always, it's just an, it's just their expertise. It's just their expert opinion that you are the authority over you and you get to decide if you do anything that they recommend. Yes, precisely, precisely. And I always say, just take it all in. You can always reject it later, Mm -hmm. right? Most people reject it before it even like, before it goes in, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, and then they blame the therapist for being a shitty therapist, you know, like it's- I've tried that, I've tried (laughs) that. Like somebody tried it this way. Nope, I did that. They're not even, they didn't even hear the words that somebody recommended. Yeah. How could you have tried that? It's a brand new- medical thing just offered by the FDA. What do you mean you've tried it? I already know about that. Yeah, but did you do it? Did you let yourself succeed with it? I mean, there's so many options we have. So Um, I think just, you know, for me in closing, there is this idea that you have everything you need. The confidence, if that's what you want to call it, the self-esteem, the comfort, you have it all. You've then created a layer over that confidence with a set of beliefs and criteria and standards and you're living by those and you're ignoring what's underneath. So this is what this podcast really gets at. We're trying to break your brain, you know, in a good way. So it goes like, ah, I don't even have an argument for that. I don't even know what to say. You caught me, (laughs) right? (laughs) Red-handed, like in the cookie jar, like got me. Um, so I think that's where we're going. This is not something you chase. This is not something you seek. Um, this is not something you're ever going to find. You will never arrive. You will never arrive Mm -hmm. because again, you're seeking what you already have. Yep. You are the pie. You have the shell, you have the filling, you have the, you have every, so I love how you said you have everything. I would offer an additional, additional, uh, set of words there. You are everything you need. Everything you need to feel excited about you and your life, 
um, liking you, loving you, you have, you are everything that's available in terms of the ingredients that are necessary for that. It's just a matter of allowing for it, accessing it and choosing it. Right. And honoring it. And I think that, yeah, I like that, you know, you're the pie, right? And it's not the pie. (laughs) It's not a set of external you are it without the boyfriend, without the roommate, without the money, yeah. without the health, without the, yeah. without whatever, without whatever. Mm-hmm. There's no criteria that enhances what you already have. Beautiful. I think we covered it today, Jill. I think we did. So that's it on <laughs> confidence, insecurity, self-esteem. Love it. Okay. I hope this was helpful. Some of you may want to rewatch or re-listen again, take some notes, right? Wherever you got angry or defensive or know that's not true, I would take some notes on that one and listen to it again. Um, It could be that there's a part of your system that you don't, you aren't giving yourself enough credit. You're relying on, on that approach that you take. You're giving it more credit than it deserves and it may not be serving you. Okay. So where where we tend to get defensive and feel like, no, 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 I have to have that. Do you though? Do you? Is mm-hmm. that your is that the structure holding you together? Or is it something bigger that's within yourself? Yeah. Love you guys. So good to see you, Jill. I love you. Yes. Good to see you too. <laughs> Bye everybody. See you next time. 